Hey, what's going on, everybody? It is officially fantasy football season 2018. We have reached the month of August, which means uh, it is time and allowable for freaks like myself to uh, start talking about football and drafts and auctions and players and sleepers and busts and uh, all that fun stuff that if you haven't shut this off by now, you love. I'm sure of it. So while we're not doing the full dive today, I just wanted to, uh, you know, wet our appetites with a quick one here. The full team by team, uh, player by player, quick breakdown that I usually do each year. That'll be coming in a couple weeks. For today, where I'm going to look at some players that I am not drafting off my board and some players that I am over drafting that I'm going to reach for. And we'll do running backs, wide receivers, and tight ends. Quarterbacks, who cares? You can always get a good one at some point in the draft. Uh, so I don't have much opinion there. Um, and we'll take it from you know, top end of each position, middle, lower tier. I have four running backs that I'm not interested in, four wide receivers I'm not interested in, and two tight ends. And on the overdraft reach portion, we got three, three, and two. So we'll go pretty quick. This is not going to be a long one, as I uh, said earlier. So right now, let's go with running backs that I am not drafting. Starting at the top, Ezekiel Elliott. Um, now listen, every player has value. So if uh, I'm in some weird draft and Zeke is sitting there at uh, pick 12, I would certainly consider him over the likes of uh, Leonard Fournette. But... Where you have to take Zeke, probably in the top five, six of your draft, uh, he's not cutting it for me. That team's going to be bad. That offense is going to be bad. They don't have playmakers, which means, sure, a ton of touches. Uh, I don't doubt it. He, The positives, obviously, great offensive line. Uh, I think the only guy in the league in the last two years to average over 100 rush yards per game. My problem, poor offense, doesn't catch passes, or at least not enough passes to be considered in the elite with uh, Le'Veon, Gurley, David Johnson. Uh, I probably would even put Kamara and Saquon Barkley and even Melvin Gordon um, above Zeke this year. Uh, so for me, if I have that many guys, plus Antonio Brown, Hopkins, maybe even Beckham uh, up there, Zeke is probably you know somewhere around 10 on my board, and I will never get him at that point. LaShawn McCoy comes in next. Off-field troubles aside, um, you know that could just be the icing on the cake here. Even before that, he was not really going to be on my radar. One reason, the Bills. They are going to be atrocious. They, last year, were one of the worst playoff teams I've ever seen. I don't know how that happened. They lost three offensive linemen. Uh, they have a rookie QB. And McCoy has already come out and said that he probably wants to not go too hard this year and preserve his body to lengthen his career. He's thinking Hall of Fame, legacy, record books, all that fun stuff. He's not he's not in it for the uh, the greater cause here and the games he plays purely on volume, he will probably be a, you know, top 20 running back each time he plays. I just think he's going to kind of mail it in a little bit this year and I think that team is going to be absolutely atrocious, one of the three worst in the entire league and I think McCoy probably signs out quickly. Kenyon Drake, Miami Dolphins. Weeks, I believe, 8 or 9 to week 16 last year burst on the scene after they traded Ajayi and was a you know, top 15 RB. Very impressive. Nobody expected it. I personally see that they signed Frank Gore. They draft a rookie, Kalen Balaj. Uh, I don't think they trust Drake to be that every down, three down back for the entire season. I don't think his body can handle it. I just don't think he is good enough to take uh, in the mid-third round, end of third round, where you have to draft him. I am going to pass and let somebody else get on the Drake bandwagon. Uh, they're just much better options at other positions, especially where he falls in the draft. And finally, out of the running backs, Carlos Hyde. Quality player. Great season last year in San Fran. Now comes over to Cleveland. Initially, love the signing. I love that offense. I think they are one of the more improved units in the league. I think they have weapons at every position. 
after they drafted Nick Chubb, uh, I thought that was a big problem for Hyde because they have Duke Johnson already as a pass catching back, one of, if not the best in the league, uh, you know, a lock for 60 catches. So Hyde uh, is not catching passes out of the backfield. And I think Nick Chubb out of Georgia is an elite talent. I think in a couple of years, he's going to be one of the better early down backs in the league. And I think with that type of talent around Hyde, he's probably the one that's going to get pushed out. Even if he does hold on to part of the rotation, I think that's what it is, a rotation. Not to mention all the weapons they have on the outside with Gordon and Landry and Joku. Uh, they're pretty loaded. A lot of talent there, and Hyde's just not going to do it for me. Wide receiver, Tyreek Hill. One of the more exciting players in the league. Uh, probably won a bunch of people some money last year with uh, daily fantasy and even season-long fantasy. His efficiency, though, is not sustainable. I believe all of his touchdowns were or 30 or all but one of his touchdowns were 30 yards out or something ridiculous, ridiculous, not sustain, sustainable statistic. Um, so Tyreek, for me, at the you know end of the second, beginning of the third round, where you have to draft him, middle of third even, too rich for my blood. They bring in Sammy Watkins, who, if you know me, you know that I have a weird man love for Sammy. So he's... He's one of the more talented receivers in the league. Between him, a rookie quarterback, Kelsey, Kareem Hunt, a lot going on there. Uh, I just don't think Tyreek has the built-in touches uh, to guarantee that type. Like His efficiency has to remain for him to reach his draft value, and I just think it's not doable. Brandon Cooks, moving on from one year in New England over to the Rams, kind of taking Sammy Watkins' spot. Um, well, you saw what happened last year with Sammy. They just didn't use him well enough or enough enough, period. They went to Gurley, Robert Woods, Cup, spread it out. Their offense took a huge leap, um, which I think surprised a lot of people. I don't think it takes another leap now that Cooks is there. I think Cooks is there for his speed to clear out space so they can operate underneath with Gurley and Woods and Cup under the middle. And I, I just don't even trust... Jared Goff as a, a top-line quarterback. Um, I don't know that he has the arm strength to feed Cooks the way Cooks needs to be fed. Think about Cooks. And, like, his the start of his career is, is historic in a way with 1,000-yard seasons and double-digit touchdowns. And he's been unbelievable, but he's had Breeze and Brady for a year now throwing him the ball. Um, I don't trust the system. I don't trust the quarterback to make Cooks a, you know, solid wide receiver too. He's not going to be on any of my teams this year. Alshon Jeffrey, I, I heard an amazing stat, and I'm actually going to butcher it right now because I didn't write it down before recording this, but it is something like, like Alshon has not had a 100-yard receiving game in the last 30 games, including playoffs. You know, back when he was taking the league by storm in his second year and helping me win a uh, fantasy football title, um, since then... He's had some injuries, he had a PED situation, and in like, I think it's been 22 games since the PED thing happened. Um, and like I said, no games over 100, like maybe, maybe he had some assistance when he was dominating guys uh, early in his career and a little more athletic. He's always a little banged up. Just, um, and he's on an offense that doesn't feature him. They kind of like to spread the ball around, run the ball, give Aguilar now some love in the slot. Ertz, now they have this, uh, Mammoth rookie tight end Goodert, who's uh, taking up some love. So I just don't think Alshon is worth the uh, draft capital where you need to take him. And finally, for the receivers, Devontae Parker. You know that uh, famous Maya Angelou quote, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them? That's my uh, Devontae Parker take. You know, he's had enough chances time after time after time every year. We always love the pedigree and think that this is his year. Well, I understand the case because Jarvis Landry is out and 160 targets are gone. So Parker's floor is probably 110 targets, which is great for somebody that you can get in the 7th, 8th, ninth round. However, I'm just going to stick to not believing in him as a football player. I think Miami's not going to be great. I don't really trust Tannehill. I think it'll be more of Stills being the real number one there and Amendola and Albert Wilson. Um picking up the Jarvis Landry slack and Devontae Parker just kind of being Devontae Parker again. 
Moving to tight end, I'll give you two names. One, Jimmy Graham. Even though he is moving over to the best quarterback in the league in Aaron Rodgers, um, Russell Wilson was not a bad uh, bad guy throwing him in Breeze before that, so he's had a pretty nice run. I think all he is is a big, fat red zone target, and he might score 10 touchdowns. He really might, but I think if he doesn't, the weeks he doesn't, he's going to crush you. I think there's going to be a lot of two catches for 11 yards and a touchdown, and that's going to be the high end for Jimmy Graham, and I do not want that on my football team. Number two is Eric Ebron. He's been going off the board as like a tight end one, like the 10th to 13th-ish tight end off the board. I'd rather have his teammate Jack Doyle. Him and Luck already have the rapport. The the strong, I guess the, the sell for Ebron is that the Colts are kind of all over the place after T.Y. Hilton, so maybe he can step up. He has the pedigree, he has the talent, he has the frame at least. Um, if you think Luck is going to be Andrew Luck again, I think he probably is. There might be some balls for for Ebron. I just prefer Doyle, and I think I think Ebron is just being drafted too high based on name and history. That's what you got for uh, guys that are off my draft board as of today, about a month out of uh, draft day for me. Now let's give you some guys quickly who I am overdrafting. I am reaching a bit for these guys a round or two or three, depending on who they are. And again, a little high to medium end, and then just work our way down. Running back, the one guy who was on every single one of my teams last year, uh, I like him again this year, and that's Rex Burkhead. I think he is, as long as he stays healthy, he's the guy in New England that is guaranteed to get 200-plus touches. Michelle, the rookie, obviously high draft capital coming off the board at, I think, 27 or 28 or 22 or whatever it was. Rashad Penny might have been 27, the other ridiculous first-round draft pick. Uh, Anyhow, Michelle already banged up, known for a little fumble issues back at Georgia. Uh, and Burkhead's just good, man. You, you compare him last year even to Deion Lewis, who won people some titles down the stretch. Burkhead just gets it done, gets the goal line carries, gets catches out of the backfield. He, when given the shot, is a really good football player. If you're telling me that he's going to get 12, 15 on the low end touches a game and maybe even up to 20, I think you're looking at a high-end RB2 that you can get in the sixth round right now. I think as camp moves on, he probably will creep up a little bit, probably into that fifth round, maybe even tail into the fourth if we get some you know, more news and out of camp and see some you know, Rex highlights in the preseason. Uh, that could happen, but for now, I think Rex is a great value. The New England backfield, however you piece it together, is always one of the top five in the league. They use their backs a lot. Gio Bernard, the pass catching, I guess you could say backup to Joe Mixon, but what I love about Gio is I think he has a nice floor as the pass catching back. He's always produced when given opportunity. He had that role with Jeremy Hill uh, his first couple years and was a top 20 back in, in all of them. Um, I think Joe Mixon is talented. I think the Cincinnati offense will be better. But so Geo gives you a nice floor. But in the situation that Mixon sucks or goes down or gets hurt, Geo, I think, can carry the load as a frontline starter and be a three down back in that situation. And those are the type of guys that I'm looking to draft. Guys with high floors and ridiculously high ceilings if some you know things go awry, which they always do. And finally, running back, Naheem Hines. Uh, going back to what I said about Ebron, the Colts have T.Y. Hilton and a bunch of question marks. In the backfield, out wide, they don't know what's going on, so I think a little gadget player like Naheem Hines, the speedster rookie, who can play a little running back and a little slot receiver, I think he could sneak in and be the guy that just gets the ball. They get the ball in his hands 10 times a game. And I think with 10 touches a game, you're looking at an RB, a sneaky RB2 in PPR leagues there with Naeem Hines. So I'll be overdrafting him come draft day, unless by then we hear that Jordan Wilkins has taken the running back job and run with it, and he's going to be the guy. I assume it'll be Marlon Mack, but who knows? Maybe that rookie Jordan Wilkins comes out of nowhere. Or we hear that Ryan Grant has really solidified the wide receiver two role, and we see him in the week three preseason game 
go for uh, you know seven and ninety two and a touchdown, and we're all excited about Ryan Grant. As of now, with the question marks there, I'll put my money on a speed demon rookie that um, Andrew Luck will fall in love with. Wide receiver, Stefan Diggs. I think Stefan Diggs is a wide receiver one masquerading as a wide receiver two. So I think right now you can draft Diggs as the 15th wide receiver off the board. I think he's more like somewhere in the five to eight range. Uh, when he played at the beginning of last year, before he got hurt, I want to say the first four weeks of the season, he was the wide receiver one in all of football, and like by a wide margin. He lost Case Keenum, but gained Kirk Cousins. I don't think that's an issue. I think that's an upgrade. Um, I think Diggs is a super talented player, and I think he has had periods where he hasn't performed. I personally think it's due to injury, and I will take the discount and uh, gladly take Stefan Diggs in the third round uh, wherever I pick. Even if I'm picking you know, at the end of the second, beginning of the third, at that turn, I'll take him there. Hopefully I get lucky, pick at the end of the third round, and he falls to me there. Uh, I'm a big Stefan Diggs fan this year and every year, really, just as an overall football player. Second receiver that I'm overdrafting is Randall Cobb. So obviously Jordy Nelson out in Green Bay. Devontae Adams is the clear wide receiver one. But Cobb is next in the slot. And when Cobb plays with Rodgers, last year obviously Rodgers was hurt a lot, but in like the last five games, I want to say, when Rodgers came back, Cobb was six catches, five or six catches a game, 90 yards, half a touchdown. I mean, wide receiver, two numbers. I think Cobb is a third, a late third round pick that you could get in the sixth round right now, which I think is just absurd value and it gives you a share in Aaron Rodgers. I'm taking Cobb all day, and I will draft him a round or two even higher than uh, than his average draft position is as of this moment. And finally, out of the wide receivers, Kenny Galladay out of Detroit. I don't know how it's going to happen. This is just a gut thing. Um, obviously, Stafford has Marvin Jones, Golden Tate uh, as the incumbents, as successful players, two guys that I would have on my team for sure, definitely Golden Tate for sure. Um, I think Galladay is better. I think Galladay is a potential wide receiver one in the making. 6'4", 220. I think, I don't know, like I said, I don't know how the opportunity is going to be there. Maybe he's going to take that Bolden role from two years ago where now that Ebron's gone, he can be the third wide receiver but also act as a tight end because of his big frame. I just see Kenny Galladay being a big-time player in this league. I don't know if it happens right now, but I'm willing to bet with my you know, 11th, 10th, 12th round pick that uh, somehow he and Stafford connect as soon as this year. Tight end, finishing up here. Jordan Reed. So you can give me a top three tight end, because that's what he is, in the 7th, 8th round. Sign me up. I don't care if it's risky, if Jordan Reed is an injury risk every single week, especially in leagues, which is the majority of leagues where you only start one tight end. I can always find someone on the waiver wire that is playable. So if uh, weeks that I know Reed is not going to be in there, A, he's got a great backup in Vernon Davis, so make it a priority to get him if Reed ever goes down. But if not, there are only 12 starting tight ends in your league, most likely each week, maybe a few backups. There's probably 10 guys, whether it's Ben Watson or Ricky Seals-Jones or Eric Ebron. Um, and there are many others, which I'm just, you know, Hunter uh, Hurst, the uh, Hayden Hurst, sorry. I mean, right now I'm blanking on the names, but point being, there are plenty of guys that you could always plug in if Reed goes down. And if he doesn't, you have a top three tight end that you get as the 10th tight end off the board absurd value and a risk I am willing to take every single day of the week. Finally, the other tight end, George Kittle out in San Fran, an athletic freak being paired up with uh, Jimmy GQ over there. I think that offense obviously takes a leap with Jimmy and Kyle Shanahan. Everyone's excited about it. They don't have a strong wide receiver one. I like Goodwin. I like Garcon, but they don't have somebody who's going to dominate the targets and the touches out there. So I think Kittle can sneak in and be the guy. My fear is in the next month, he starts to creep up draft boards. I'm starting to hear some talk about him, whereas a month ago, 
a lot of uh, casual fantasy football players probably hadn't even heard of him. Um, now I think he might start to creep into that like sleeper range with the Trey Burtons of the world where he might not last as long as you need him to to then overdraft him. So that's my thought there with Kittle. So there you have it, guys. A first quick look at uh, the fantasy football landscape as I see it heading into 2018. I'm sure my opinion will uh, change here and there over the next four weeks before draft day, but let's uh, get the chatter going. Please reach out, hit me up, Twitter, cheller32, Instagram, chrisheller.me, or just use your resources and uh, figure it out, and let's uh, talk some football, because I am ready to rock. See you soon.